Well, hello everyone. Thank you for being here. And uh, sorry, I'm the last person holding you from a cold beer. So I'll try to do this quick and we'll try to make it entertaining. My name is Abdel. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I spent best of my time doing infrastructure in data centers. The last five years, I was actually in um, professional services, which is the consulting part of Google Cloud. And I did quite a lot of implementations around Google Cloud, specifically Kubernetes, containers, and service mesh. The talk with its very provocative title, the idea here is to give you my five or six lessons learned in doing service mesh implementations. Hopefully, some, some of them will resonate with you. I have to be clear that most of these things are actually um, related to the service mesh tool I use, which is Istio, which is one of the biggest and popular and kind of the first one to come up with this idea of service mesh. But hopefully, these learnings will be applicable to any other tool because although most service mesh tools claim to be different, they are pretty much implementing things the same way. And architectures are very similar. I'm going to touch at the end on the, on the future. I don't know if you have heard of this, but we came up with something called ambient mesh. It's a pretty new concept. So I'm going to mention it briefly at the end. But basically, I'm going to do a quick introduction. So for those who doesn't know what service mesh is, hopefully you will have a basic understanding. We're going to talk about the lesson learned and then what the future holds. Uh, there are a bunch of stuff I'm going to skip through. We used to do monolithics. People used to think that they're cool. And then at some point, they think that they're not cool anymore. So they started wrapping up monolithics with APIs. Um, and then this concept of API gateways at some point showed up, where basically you take a monolithic app, you put an API gateway around it, and you call it a modern application, which is not really that modern. And then, as every developer ever said, let's rewrite everything from scratch. And that's how microservices started. So the whole concept of microservices is you take a monolithic application, you split it into small chunks. Each chunk does one specific thing and does it well. It could be a business application. It could be a feature. It could be anything. Um, they are smaller. They are very easy to release. They are loosely coupled, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody knows all of these things. So I, I, I'm going to skip through these basic concepts. And this clicker is not doing well. So I'm just going to use the keyboard. And then containers showed up at some point with Docker. Well, Docker really just democratized the concept of containers. Containers existed in Linux for a very long time. But what containers did is they made microservices easier. Um, they are very easy. They are very immutable. They avoid the problem of it works in, in my machine because a container is inherently an application, its configuration, and its dependencies all bundled in the same thing. Um, they are very easy to bin pack. You can just cramp as many containers as you want on a single node, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you run containers at scale, you run into this day two problems. Running two or three or 10 containers on computer with Docker Compose is easy. Running thousands of containers in production at scale comes with a bunch of issues. How do you schedule them? How do you distribute them? How do you restart them, monitor them? How do you persist data in case you need to write data somewhere? How do you do service discovery, which is how do you make one service find another without having to hard code the IP address or FQDN or whatever, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what Kubernetes really was created to solve. So Kubernetes was released in 2014. Um, it's a, it's a basically, effectively, an abstraction layer on top of a bunch of machines, or nodes, or servers, or laptops, or Raspberry Pis. Doesn't matter. Um, it's meant, or it's created, to let you, as a developer or as a user, focus on the application and not on the infrastructure. So you have a bunch of servers. You deploy Kubernetes and abstraction layer on top of them. You talk to the Kubernetes cluster, and the Kubernetes cluster does thing for you, right? Um, open source projects, yalla, yalla, yalla. I think most people you know, know all of these things. But I want to actually focus on this specific point here. Because a lot of times, people kind of confuse Kubernetes that is only an abstraction layer. Kubernetes is effectively two different things. It is an abstraction layer with a control plane and data plane and nodes, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what people know it is. But one of the most powerful concepts of Kubernetes, in my opinion, is this concept of declarative controllers. It's the idea that as a developer or as a user, you don't tell the cluster what to do. You express intent to the cluster in the form of a YAML file. And then somewhere in the cluster, there is a controller, which is a piece of code, that will take that intent, I want you to do this, and translate it into reality. So let's say a very simple example would be you want to deploy a container. In Kubernetes world, we call that a pod. You send your container manifest, which is the YAML file, to the control plane. The control plane will store that for you. And then somewhere a controller is responsible for making that actual development ha deployment happen. So it will trigger. And that's what we call the observed part. So it will monitor what the cluster tells it you should happen and what's actually happening right now. So intent versus reality. It will compare 
the cluster is telling me I should have a deployment or I should have a pod or a container. There is no container right now, and it will act on that. So act is deploy the container. And this control loop concept applies pretty much everywhere in Kubernetes. If you have used Kubernetes before, you know that basically you write a YAML file, you submit it to the cluster. As long as your YAML file is valid and doesn't have any errors, things magically happen behind the scene, right? So very high level architecture of Kubernetes. It's important to understand this for the remainder of the presentation. You as a developer or as a user, you will use an API or a command line or a GUI or the combination of the three of them. You talk to what we call a control plane. A control plane is either one or three nodes or five or however you want to run. Inside there are a bunch of components. The main ones are the four you see on the screen. The API server is the component to which you send your commands using the kubectl command line or the GUI or whatever. ETCD is a distributed key value store. That's where the things you want the cluster to do will be stored. So that's where YAML files are stored effectively. Then the controllers is what I talked about. They basically monitor ETCD through the API server and they act when there is something that needs to happen. The scheduler does scheduling, right? It just finds a node to run your workload. On the workload side or the worker node side or the data plane side, however you want to call it, you have a bunch of components. The major ones are the kubelet, the kubeproxy, and the container runtime. Very briefly, the kubeproxy does network programming. It makes sure that the node is programmed properly such a way that containers can talk to each other. That's what the kube proxy does. It's not an actual proxy, by the way. It doesn't sit on the data path. When containers are talking to each other, they don't go through the kube proxy. They just go through the node. The kubelet, its job is to A, receive orders from the API server, and B, report the status of the node back to the API server. Then the container runtime, whether that's Docker, container D, Rocket, whatever container runtime you have there, will basically run the container for you. Now, all of this is actually kind of an indirect way of you doing a Docker run. When you do a Docker run on your computer, you are essentially talking to the Docker daemon, which runs the container for you. In a Kubernetes world, you tell the API server that tells ETCD, that tells the controller, that tells the scheduler, that tells the kubelet to run the doc Docker run for you. Right? It's a very indirect way of running a container. At the end of the day, what happens is that some container runtime somewhere will fire up a container for you. Right? And then, you know, a bunch of extra magic. If a node goes down, the controller will detect that and will just redistribute your workloads across all the other available nodes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm going to skip this one. But believe it or not, Kubernetes doesn't solve all your problems. Um, and I'm going to take one simple example. So let's say you have two services, two applications, two containers, it doesn't matter. And they talk to each other over HTTP or gRPC or whatever. And then at some point, a security person comes to you and says, like, we want to add MTLS. Um, so for you who doesn't understand what MTLS is, MTLS stands for mutual TLS. It's essentially TLS, where a client verifies the identity of the server. But with MTLS, the server also verifies the identity of a client, right? So in normal TLS, which is what happens between you and Google.com, for example, you as, you as the client or as the browser, you are connecting to a server. The server sends you a certificate. And your client, which is the browser, verify that certificate to make sure that the server is who they say they are. In an MTLS world, you as the client, in this case, service A, when you make that TLS call to the server, you are also sending your own certificates, which allows the server to verify your identity. That's essentially what MTLS is, right? So let's say you want to add MTLS. Very easily, if you have two containers, you can just mount a bunch of certificates into service A, mount, mount a bunch of certificates into service B, use a library, mount those certificates, and use them to make the call. Doing this at scale could be complicated. Doing it for thousands of containers could be complicated, because if you have certificates, you have to issue them, sign them, verify them, rotate them, et cetera, et cetera. So, at some point, some people came up with this idea saying, why don't we do a control plane that does search management for us, right? So why don't we have that functionality of certificate management done by a centralized place or centralized component? And we can also make that centralized component do a bunch of things, like enforce policies. That control, control plane or controller or points or thingy can tell the service on both sides only accept calls from service A if they meet certain criteria. Criteria. I'm going to talk about a specific example. Or why don't we make that control plane also collect a bunch of telemetries or does some routing, et cetera, et cetera. 
And you can think about any sort of policies that you will want to enforce between microservices can actually be done with a central control plane. Timeouts, you can, you can make the control plane tell a service to randomly timeout every now and then, or to do a retry, or to implement a circuit breaking, or anything like that. So for some time, these functionalities have been implemented through proxy libraries. Those are dependencies that you can import in your code, and then you can make them do all these functionalities, policy enforcement, certificate management, et cetera, et cetera. The problem with proxy libraries and the code dependencies is that if you work in a big organization and you are using five or six programming languages, you're effectively going to be using five or six proxy libraries that does exactly the same thing, but they're written in different programming languages. So you have to maintain them, and you have to patch them, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this is core to what a service mesh is. The whole point of a service mesh is to say, why don't we decouple those network functionalities from the application and have them implemented by a proxy, an actual binary which acts as a proxy. The proxy will sit in between all the applications. Services will send their traffic to the proxy. The proxy will implement all these traffic shaping, traffic management, policy enforcement features. And then the proxies will talk to each other over a secure medium like MTLS. And that's essentially what a service mesh is, or at least what the first iteration of Istio was. Istio came up with this idea where they introduced a control plane, which is just a pod, it's just a container that runs inside Kubernetes. And then they used Envoy, which is an open source C++ based proxy that have been developed by Lyft. That Envoy actually is very cool because it has two main functionalities. A, it can be configured using APIs, so you don't need configuration files. And B, it can hot reload this configuration. So when you are introducing a new policy or a new change, you don't need to restart the proxy, right? It can hot reload its configuration while it's working. If you are rotating a, a, a certificate, for example, you don't necessarily want to restart your workloads, right? So the people who wrote Istio, they implemented the existing API surface of, of Envoy, made the control plane that can understand this API, right? and then made the API accessible through the Kubernetes API, such a way that as a user, you continue using the same concepts in Kubernetes, you still write a YAML file, send it to your Kubernetes cluster, then your Kubernetes cluster will hand it off to the control plane of Istio, which then will translate whatever configuration you say into something that the Envoy proxy understand. And I'm gonna talk about specific example later. Um, in this example, so this is, as I said, the first iteration of Istio service mesh and the current iteration, it's still the, the same architecture. Other tools uses different architectures. It's always a control plane and a data plane using, using proxies. Linkerd uses a different proxy. They have their own control plane. Cilium does this with eBPF, which is the new service mesh that was released. They, instead of using the proxy, they do some stuff on the node, but pretty much most service meshes have a concept of control plane and data plane, right? And Again, specifically to Istio, it does also have something called an ingress gateway, which is just a specific proxy that is responsible for getting traffic from outside the service mesh into the service mesh and implemented policies. So you can do GWT token validation, you can remove TLS certificates before you route the traffic to inside, et cetera, et cetera. And they also have an egress gateway, which is same component as the ingress gateway, but works on the way out. So if your service mesh is trying to call an external endpoint, you can force your traffic through the ingress gateway and have the ingress gateway implement certain policies and collect certain telemetry and do some routing, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, let's take a very specific example. This is just, again, it's too specific, but most service mesh have something like this. This is called traffic splitting. So say I have a service B version one, I'm introducing service B version two, and I want to do a canary deployment. I want to send 95% of my traffic to version A, 5% to version B. I have to use, in, in the issue world, there are two objects you use. One of them is called the virtual service. It essentially just says virtual B exists in two versions, version one and version two. And then the destination rule, which is an object that, uh, sorry, the other way around. Destination rule dis declares the, the, the subsets. And then the virtual service says 95% of traffic goes to version one, 5% of traffic goes to version two, right? This is just one example of traffic routing that Istio can do. It can do more than this. And by the way, to be very precise, the reason why these things are possible with the service mesh, and the reason why we call it a service mesh, is because every single container, every single instance of your application 
has an envoy running alongside it. Right? That's what we call that a sidecar in Kubernetes. But essentially, there is as many containers, envoy containers, as many application containers. And there is a one-to-one -one mapping between them, right? So when you do something like a canary deployment, because all the traffic goes through the sidecars, we are actually implementing a real 95.5%. Because the sidecar on the way out will do will count 95 requests going to version one and then five requests going to version two. Right? And then in case you update that object and you say, well, now I'm confident my version two is good and I want to do 10% of the traffic. You just have to update these values, send it to the cluster, and then on the spot, on the flight, the traffic will be split according to the weights you have defined. Um, you can also do fault injection. These are just another example. You can say, I am introducing a fault for five second delays on 0.1% of my traffic. So every 1% of my traffic, I want to have a five seconds delay on this service so I can see how the client reacts when there is a delay on the new version of the service, right? And you can do timeouts. You can do a bunch of interesting things. Istio have been created specifically to run on Kubernetes. Most service meshes actually run on Kubernetes, although sometimes they claim they can do VMs. They do VMs, but they mostly are designed for Kubernetes. Um, because it leverages a lot of these Kubernetes native ways of doing things, the control plane is just a pod. The proxy is just a container running inside the pod where your application is, right? And then your configuration is a YAML file, basically similar to how you deploy things in Kubernetes and how we define services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, so, in a nutshell, a service mesh gives you kind of four main benefits. The, the ability to connect things together, so the ability to connect services to each other and do service discovery out of the box. The ability to secure traffic by introducing MTLS. The ability to control the, the traffic by introducing traffic routing, timeouts, et cetera, et cetera. And then observing. You can collect a bunch of telemetries and then store them somewhere and then observe them and see how the service mesh is reacting, right? Now, what are the drawbacks? What are the, the four main challenges that, in my opinion, service meshes still have today? So one of them is capacity and resources. A service mesh runs proxies with your application containers, and those proxies have a footprint. They consume CPU and memory, and you have to keep that in mind, right? There is network latency. Whenever there is a proxy, there is network latency. There is no way around it. Um, there are certain challenges with how you design an architecture service mesh, such a way that it's kind of scalable from day one if you want. And then once you have a service mesh tool deployed, it will give you a bunch of data and telemetry and logs. And in order to take advantage of those, those information, you will need to deploy extra things. And that's what I call auxiliary infrastructure. You need to deploy extra piece of soft software, extra things in order to collect telemetry and store it and visualize it, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to walk through each of those separately. I'm realizing I'm going fast, so we should try to slow down a little bit. So capacity and resources. Um, taking, this is just a snapshot from the Istio benchmark on the latest version. Every, almost every service mesh tool that exists deploy, publishes some sort of benchmark. You can look it up. Linkerd have one. Cilium has one. And they all, because the tool that is used to do benchmark is an open source tool. It's a service mesh tool that is, uh, so it's an open source service mesh benchmarking tool that can actually use to run against pretty much all service meshes. So in the case of Istio specifically, if you have um, a service mesh with 70,000 requests and 1,000 services, so if you have 1,000 services, basically 1,000 containers, you will have 2,000 in total because 1,000 application containers and then 1,000 uh, uh, invoice sidecars, so that's 2,000 containers in total. And at 1,000 requests per second per service, each proxy consumes 0.35 vCPU and 40 megabytes of memory. Now, at a single service scale, that doesn't sound like much, but at a thousand services scale, that's almost 35 vCPU and about four terabytes of memory, right? So the resource footprint that the sidecars will consume is quite significant. And you have to keep that in mind, both when you are designing, because when you run in the cloud, the cloud is not unlimited, and you have to do capacity planning, and you have to make sure you have enough capacity to run your workloads, and also in terms of how much you're going to spend on using a service mesh, right? So there is basically a cost to benefit analysis you have to do about how much am I going to actually spend on running this versus the benefits I'm taking from it. And 
just a side note, about 80%, this is a very rough number, I don't have the exact data, but about 80% of projects I worked on where service mesh was introduced, those introduced to do MTLS. So customers go like, oh, this thing can do MTLS, let's use it. So they basically install a thing or a service mesh that does a lot of features. They use it on of their MTLS and they end up spending quite a significant amount of resources on a single, very simple feature, right? So that's something you have, you have to keep in mind. Then S2D, which is the control plane, consumes one vCPU and 1.5 gigabytes of memory per instance. It does auto scale because it's stateless, so you can just have multiple replicas if you have a big service mesh. So of course, the more service mesh, the, the more the bigger your service mesh is, the more your control plane is gonna, the bigger your control plane is gonna be. Now latencies. Um, Again, same thing with Istio, just numbers from Istio. I, I, I bet you can find numbers for other service mesh tools. Um, between 1.7 and 2.7 milliseconds at 90 and 95% tile, um, uh, 90 and 99% tile uh, traffic. So, again, probably not that significant, 1.7 milliseconds, but in some applications it have been. Um, in my opinion, one of the most common use cases where latency was a problem was when you are deploying a tool that's, that fires up containers very quickly. So I'm, I can take a very ex so simple example. Uh, Argo is a known software that has multiple, that, like, it's a community that have multiple pieces of software. They have a CI/CD pipeline, but they also have a data, data transformation or data orchestration tool. It just allows you to essentially deploy a data orchestrator that triggers on events, do some transformation on data, and then stores the results and die. So essentially, it's a control plane that just fires up containers to do specific things. When we, when we used that with issue sidecar, the 1.7 and 2.7 milliseconds became a huge problem because suddenly an operation that takes 20 milliseconds takes 22 milliseconds. Or a container that only takes 60 seconds to run will take two minutes to run, right? Third one is design and architecture. This is just a very simple, complex example of you can, one of the things actually, one of the advantages of service mesh is that you can do um, a global service mesh. So you can have multiple clusters in multiple zones and have one logical service mesh spanning across all of them. And the reason why you want to do this, for example, is imagine you are at the FIFA World Cup and you have your website where you sell tickets. You, you might be able to deploy all the services in all the regions so that user latency is low but at some point you want to take down one microservice. So let's say this blue microservice in Japan, we want to take it down to replace it. We can still instruct the service mesh to say, if the local service, microservice is not available, route to the nearest one. The problem with this kind of designs is that this is a one or nothing choice. You have to decide day one if you want to do this, because if you don't and you end up designing with single region, expanding into multi-region can be a problem, right? And vice versa. So if you start day one saying, I want to do multi-region, and then suddenly you say like, I don't care, I just want my data to be in Europe because you know, we don't like the Americans, that could be a problem, right? So, so, so basically the point here is that your design and architecture choice can be difficult to make in the beginning because it's hard to change things going forward. Different service meshes are trying to solve this problem in different ways, but they all have drawbacks. So kind of a balance, it's again a balance that you have to strike. And the last but not least is this auxiliary infrastructure I talked about. So Istio runs on Kubernetes, that's the main story, but now you need to visualize your service mesh. They have this tool called Kiali, which is like a GUI that can allow you to visualize the service mesh and see which services talk to each other. That's a workload, you have to run that and you have to spend CPU and memory in it and you have to maintain it and patch it, etc. You have Jaeger for tracing, again, software, you have to install it, maintain it, blah, blah. You have Prometheus and Grafana for monitoring and, and for monitoring basically. Install it, maintain it, etc. So all these like extra pieces of infrastructure that you're gonna deploy in order to take advantage of what the service mesh gives you out of the box is things that you have to pay for, maintain, have people take care of it, patch it, etc. So that's something you have to keep in mind. So in a nutshell, these are the why nots, in my opinion. So don't take a simplistic approach. Don't say we need security. So this is, a, this, this, this is coming from a very um, typical conversation I was having when I was a consultant with customers. Can this thing the security? Yes. Can it do MTLS? Yes. Um, is MTLS a pain to manage without service mesh? Yes. So let's use it, right? Very simplistic approach without taking in, in consideration all the stuff I talked about. Um, 
Sometimes your service mesh is not compatible with your application. The case of Argo CD I talked about earlier is one simple example where, um, the, uh, by the way, if you are on Kubernetes, you know that this is this common problem which haven't been solved yet in a Kubernetes environment. If you have a pod with multiple containers, you cannot decide in which order they start. You cannot orchestrate the order yet. <laughs> so one of the problems with a sidecar is that when you have an envoy, when you have a sidecar, the sidecar has to be ready and operational before your application can actually make network calls. So if you have an application that tries to resolve DNS as part of its bootstrapping because it's connecting to a remote configuration server, if the envoy is not ready, your application will not be able to talk to the network and it might just die and crash and restart. And we have seen this happening before. Um, you have to have theoretical and practical knowledge, understanding how this thing works because when it breaks, it's very difficult to debug. It will increase your technical depth, that's for sure. And it will increase your operational complexity. So these are the why not. Now, what's the future holding for us? We have announced, or Google, well, Istio have announced this thing called Ambient Mesh. Ambient Mesh is essentially what it's trying to do is splitting service mesh functionalities into two layers and saying, if you only want MTLS, we can give you MTLS via a very simple overlay, which is just a very simple proxy. I'm going to show how it works later. Then if you want to optionally enable L7 processing features, like traffic management, like security, et cetera, et cetera, then it's an additional feature you have to turn on. And that's, the, that's trying to solve the problem of Istio being this thing where you, only, only, you either use all of it or nothing, right? The way it will work, this is coming from the blog post that announced uh, sort of, uh, the ambient mesh, by the way, is that they are splitting the functionality into two different proxies. There is a node level proxy, so this is a node. So there is a node level proxy called the Z-Tunnel. It's a lightweight layer four proxy, and what it does is only MTLS. So it, connect, it, it intercepts traffic coming out of the containers, and then it encrypts them into an MTLS tunnel and then send them to the other uh, Z-Tunnel on the other end, right? Then if you want to enable L7, let's say you deploy a virtual service like I showed earlier, then there will be a namespace-based proxy, not a sidecar proxy anymore, so there will be a significant decrease in the footprint for all the sidecars, and that proxy will be doing L7 functionalities for the namespace. So all the containers in the namespace will share one proxy instead of each of one have its own sidecar proxy, right? And with that, that concludes, well, I have a blog post that I wrote, and it goes a little bit more into details with very specific examples, so feel free to check it out if you have, if you are, if you care. Um, and with that, I'm gonna, I think that's it for me. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe you have. I hope you have questions. I've saw some sleepy faces. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, just, yeah, just wait for the microphone. Yeah, so a uh, great talk. I'm, I'm wondering what, what would you recommend for MTLS if not service meshes? So Cilium solves that with eBPF today. It's quite new. I tried it, it works very well. Um, so that could be one option. You don't want to do MTLS manually, right? <laughs> but the, the TLDR, you don't want to do that manually. And I think I have seen that Cert Manager is trying to solve the same problem because Cert Manager effectively distributes certificates. And they were talking, I don't think, I, I don't know if it's preview or something, but they were trying to solve the same problem, which is distribute certificates essentially to workloads. Yeah, uh, I went to the Cilium uh, talk to, uh, today. Yeah. Uh, and um, is it mature enough? Uh, the ambient mesh? I would assume no. It was released back in KubeCon Valencia in May, so probably still not as mature. Even the ambient mesh that will be released by Istio is still in preview. So I would probably give it a year or a year, or a year and a half before it becomes mature and stable enough to be used in production. Make sense? Yeah, I guess it makes sense. So we're stuck with service meshes still. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Any other questions? Do you have any questions online? No? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope it was not too long. Thanks a lot.